This presentation is on oligopoly and strategic behavior. An important market structure involves a situation in which a few large firms comprise an entire industry. These firms are not perfectly competitive nor even monopolistically competitive. Because there are several of them, the pure monopoly doesn't exist. An oligopoly is what we call this situation. Characteristics of an oligopoly. Small number of firms and interdependence, that is strategic dependence between the firms. Strategic dependence is a situation in which one firm's actions with respect to price, quality, advertising, related changes may be strategically countered by the reactions of one or more other firms in the industry. Such dependence can exist only when there are a limited number of firms in an industry. How do oligopolies occur? Economies of scale, barriers to entry, or vertical or horizontal mergers can be the cause. Vertical mergers are the joining of a firm with another to which it sells an output or from which it buys an input. Horizontal mergers are the joining of firms that are producing or selling a similar product. For example, let's consider a computer chip manufacturing company. An example of a vertical merger for this company would be, for instance, purchasing a silicon mine or, on the opposite end, purchasing or merging with a computer company that would have typically bought their components. A horizontal merger would be just the merger of several computer chip manufacturing companies into one company. So how do we determine whether or not an industry is an oligopoly? We can consider the concentration ratios. The percentage of all sales contributed by the leading four or leading eight firms in an industry, sometimes called the industry concentration ratio. For example, in this industry, the top four firms account for $400 million in annual sales. The next 21 firms account for only $50 million in annual sales. So the total ratio or the concentration ratio for the top four firms would be 400 divided by 450, or 88.9% concentration ratio. Here's a chart showing some of the highest concentration ratio industries in the U.S. Alternatively, we might consider the HHI, which is e just equal to the sum of the squared sales shares of all firms in the industry. In this chart, this chart illustrates some of the issues with the concentration ratio and why we may choose to use the HHI. In Industry A, we can see that all four firms constitute 100%, the same as Industry B. However, in Industry A, the HHI is significantly higher than the HHI in Industry B. Their concentration ratios would be roughly the same, or exactly the same, at 100% while their HHIs tell a different story. We can summarize our interpretation of the previous chart as follows. While oligopolists with high market power can lead to resource misallocation similar to monopolies. However, oligopolies that occur because of economies of scale might lead to consumers paying lower prices. There's no definitive evidence of serious resource misallocation in the United States because of oligopolies. The more U.S. firms face competition from the rest of the world, the less any current oligopoly will be able to exercise market power. So how do oligopolists choose their output and price levels? They can consider a reaction function. A reaction function is just the manner in which one oligopolist reacts to a change in price, output, or quality made by another oligopolist in the industry. Then they may employ game theory. Game theory is just a way of describing the various possible outcomes in any situation involving two or more interacting individuals when those individuals are aware of the interactive nature of their situation and plan accordingly. That is, when two people are in a situation where they are reacting and interacting with each other and they're both aware of that case. There are several categories of games to consider. A cooperative game is a game in which the players explicitly cooperate to make themselves better off. 
we can consider collusion of firms for higher than competitive rates of return. Non-cooperative games are games in which the players neither negotiate nor cooperate in any way. Relatively few firms with some ability to change price. A zero-sum game is just a game in which any gains within the group are exactly offset by equal losses by the end of the game. That is, if any particular person gains, there has to be a loss by that person or someone else within the game that equals the gains. A negative sum game is a game in which players as a group lose at the end of the game. A positive sum game is the opposite, that is, a game in which players as a group are better off at the end of the game. Strategies and non-cooperative games. Strategy, that's any rule that is used to make a choice such as always pick heads if you're choosing between heads and tails on a coin. A dominant strategy is a strategy that always yields the highest benefit. That is, no matter what the other players play, you'll be best off by playing this strategy. A real-world example of game theory occurs when two people involved in a bank robbery are caught. What should they do when questioned by police? The result has been called the prisoner's dilemma. The game goes like this. The two are interrogated separately, and their interrogator indicates the following. If both confess, they each get five years in jail for the crime. If neither confesses, they each get two years based on a lesser charge. And if only one confesses, that person will go free, but the other gets ten years. So what should they do in this situation? Keep in mind that they can't have cooperated earlier on the decision. Prisoner's alternatives are shown in a payoff matrix. There are four possibilities. Either they both confess, neither confess, or prisoner 1 confesses and prisoner 2 doesn't, or prisoner 2 confesses and prisoner 1 doesn't. We can visualize the payoffs in this payoff matrix. Regardless of what the other prisoner does, each person is better off if she or he confesses. So confessing is the dominant strategy and each ends up behind bars for five years. We can apply this type of reasoning to pricing strategies. In this payoff matrix, we see what different pricing strategies can lead to for two separate firms in an industry. Opportunistic behavior. This is just behavior that consists of actions that focus on short-run gains, usually because we perceive the long-run costs to be lower than the gains in the short run. An example might be writing a check that you know will bounce. Tit for tat strategic behavior is a strategy in game theory where cooperation continues as long as both players continue to cooperate. The cartel is a group of producers in an industry that agree to set common prices and output quotas to prevent competition. The rationale for a cartel and the seeds of its undoing. If all the firms in an industry can find a way to cooperatively determine how much to produce to maximize their combined profits, then they can form a cartel and jointly act as a single producer. This means that they must collude. They must act together to attain the same outcome that a monopoly firm would aim to achieve. However, cutting back on production. A new cartel faces two fundamental problems. A monopoly producer maximizes economic profits by restraining its production to a rate below the competitive output rate. As soon as all producers in the cartel begin restraining production and charging a higher price, each individual member could, theoretically, increase its revenues and profits by charging a slightly lower price, raising production, and selling more units. So how do cartels enforce their agreement? Four conditions can make this more likely. A small number of firms in the industry relatively undifferentiated products, easily observable prices, and little variation in prices. Cartels tend to last very short periods of time. One reason is that the higher economic profits that are being received by the cartel members incentivizes new firms to enter the market. Additionally, variations in overall economic activity tend to make cartels unsustainable. Network effects. 
a situation in which a consumer's willingness to purchase a good or service is influenced by how many others also buy or have bought the item. Consider social networks like Twitter, where it's more valuable when more people use the product. Positive market feedback. Potential for a network effect to arise when an industry's product catches on. Negative market feedback. The tendency for industry sales to spiral downward rapidly when a product falls out of favor. We can also see an example of network effects in the online auction industry, where higher numbers of sellers lead to more options for buyers, and a larger number of buyers leads to the highest possible prices for sellers. In a two sided market, platform firm provides a good or service that links together two groups of end users such as those among groups A and B in figure 26.3. The platform establishes prices that are not necessarily the same for the two groups. Here the platform links end user group A and end user group B. We can consider four types of two-sided markets. The audience making markets, the matchmaking markets, the transaction based markets, and shared input markets. Network effects arise in two-sided markets. Since network effects are prevalent in two-sided markets, we often see oligopoly as the dominant structure in these types of markets. This table compares several important characteristics of the four market structures we discussed. Here we can see some of the issues of theoretical game theory. Economists at the University of Hamburg found that college students are more likely to select non-cooperative choices than are real prisoners. The conditions required of no interactions in the prisoner's dilemma is more likely to be satisfied for randomly paired students than for inmates in a prison. This chart shows the results of that study. We can see that students are more than 15% more likely to not cooperate in the prisoner's dilemma. 